There, <clears throat> there doesn't seem to be a lectern this morning, so the reason I'm standing here is not that this is much more important than anything else, just that <laughs> there isn't <laughs> anywhere down there. Uh, but I'll just check if I'm audible. Thank you. In the 17th century, we in Britain had a civil war. And one of the results of the civil war was a major disruption in the life of the British churches, especially in England and Wales. Almost everything that had been taken for granted for a century or so, in the life of the Church of England certainly, was removed from the landscape. And although it was replaced, or replaced in some form, after the monarchy was restored in 1660, that period remained as an experience of real unsettlement, real disorientation for many Anglicans in Britain. One of the great poets of the pre-Civil War period was the great George Herbert, of course. He died before the Civil War began, but his work continued to be influential. And during and after the Civil War, there was another poet who had read and digested George Herbert's work at an unusual depth. He was a physician in rural South Wales. His name was Henry Vaughan. And he set himself a really very challenging task. He lived through the disruption. His twin brother died, partly as a result of the hardships he'd endured when he was ejected from his parish. And Vaughan read Herbert's beautiful poems about the British church and looked around and the landmarks had disappeared. The lovely historic parish churches had been closed or often defaced. The lovely liturgy of the Church of England, which Herbert had known, was forbidden. And what Henry Vaughan did, or so, so some of his modern readers and scholars of his work say, was to recreate in words the landscape that had been lost. He saw his poetry as creating a landscape for the spirit. All right, so you can't go to church in the old way. So you can't go and listen to and absorb the liturgy. But Vaughan, on his runs as a physician in the Usk Valley, looked for and listened for God in the world around him. He has extraordinary poems about dawn and midnight, and you can sense the the heavy darkness of the Usk Valley. He writes a lot about the stars. Some of his very best poems are about the stars. And he saw his work as recreating Herbert's poetry, but in a quite different register, a quite different tone. The lost world of church piety had to be recreated in word and vision. And that's what he thought he was doing. I begin with that not only because I'm a passionate lover of Henry Vaughan's poetry as I am of George Herbert's, but because that image of building a landscape in words is, I think, one of the things that preaching sets out to do. We create a space in the words we use, a space in which human longing and feeling and imagining can find a home. We seek to evoke a common environment where we can walk together, not necessarily saying the same things, wearing the same clothes, walking at the same pace, but where we can walk together and recognize the landmarks and recognize each other. We seek to create this common landscape where we are familiar to each other and familiar with what we see, and yet all the time discovering 
new perspectives. I imagine that Henry Vaughan was called out dozens of times in the small hours of the morning to visit confinements and deathbeds in the Usk Valley. He must have seen glowworms and stars hundreds of times, and yet he can still write many poems about them, as if every time he looks at the stars, he sees something different. That's a poet for you. And is that not also what the preacher is trying to do? Renewing the familiar world, evoking the world we share, and yet not just providing a superior echo chamber for what people happen to take for granted or feel easy with. So that if, when we preach, we are constructing this shared landscape, we do so not in complacency that this is where we all feel cozy, but also in the hope that in that very act of creating it afresh, we are opening new perspectives, renewing the landscape, and broadening the horizon. St. Paul, in the 10th chapter of Romans, uses that resonant phrase, the word is near you. He quotes from and adapts Deuteronomy, where Moses says that the law of God is not somewhere distant, so that you have to go on long journeys, up or down, to find it. Indeed, says Paul, Christ, the word, is not somewhere else. You don't have to climb up into heaven and drag him down. You don't have to plummet the depths of the earth and excavate him. He is near you, in your lips, in your heart. And the proclamation of Jesus Christ is not so much a pointing away to something or somewhere distant, but a pointing to what is in the midst of us and what we are in the midst of, to say, Christ is where we are. Christ is where we are. And in the words and the thoughts of proclamation, we seek to help Christ's family, Christ's friends, recover and renew that sense of being in Christ, in the Christ who is the place we occupy. I begin with those general thoughts about the nature of preaching, and I'll come back to them a little bit later, to fill out slightly what I was saying yesterday in a rather more negative vein about the ways we get it wrong. Because if what I've just outlined about the nature of preaching is anywhere near the truth that we share and experience, and I hope it rings a bell or two, then we can see perhaps a bit more clearly why the various pathologies of speech we were thinking about yesterday are so dangerous and so corrosive. And in the first part of what I want to share this morning, I'd like to look at some of the things we do and say to offset the corruptions and problems identified yesterday. And then, in conclusion, to come back to that rather more general picture of what it is we're doing in saying Christ is where we are and our preaching is an attempt to evoke, construct, renew the sense of that landscape, the horizon within which we live. So I was speaking a bit yesterday about how we use our speech to mark boundaries and appeal to existing solidarities rather than imagining the contacts and exchanges that there could be. And so the first step in preaching that has some integrity and creativity is surely something to do with that very simple thing which all preachers ought to have at the top of their list of things to worry about, 
which you might call the cliché watch. In other words, when I come to a difficult point, do I simply reach for the ready-made phrase? And if I do, what do I think I'm doing? Do I reach for the ready-made phrase to spare myself the trouble? to absolve myself from the difficulty of letting it be new for me. Don't mistake me. I'm not saying that every sermon ought to be full of bright, new, minted theological ideas. Otherwise, we would all have nervous breakdowns within six weeks. And our congregations would have nervous breakdowns within four. <laughs> I'm simply saying that, yes, of course, there are occasions where we can't do much more than reach for ready-made phrases particularly in moments of counselling and accompaniment, where, frankly, people don't want us to be original, they just want us to be there. But in the pulpit, if we do find ourselves reaching for the ready-made phrase, then at least let's be aware of what we're doing. It may even be necessary to say, look, you all have heard this, and I'm not sure I understand it much better than you do, but let it stand for a moment and we'll see if we can build around it, rather than simply allowing the cliché to fall like a collapsing tombstone flat on the people in front of you. We've heard sermons like that, I'm sure, and I dare say some of us have delivered them too. So cliché watch. Are we reaching for the shortcut? Are we simply allowing our speech to be stale? And that does, of course, entail something of what I was hinting at yesterday in terms of our willingness to hear how I'm being heard, to project myself into the hearer's place, to get some sense of what will come across as stale, what will come across as different, what will come across as difficult, not to mention what will come across as offensive. The words I use mustn't be just flags, tribal flags, signs of ex existing solidarity. In mapping out that landscape that we share and that we're trying to explore more deeply, they need at least in some ways to point to something and say, look at that. Do you know, I'd never noticed that before and perhaps you haven't. So much of good preaching is that moment of, look at that. On British television a few years ago, there was a wonderful series following a group of people who were making a journey by barge along the canals of Britain. And one of the presenters was a very well-known Irish comic. And he developed a real speciality when a new view came up of sitting back and saying, will you look at that? <laughs> will you look at that? <laughs> well, I think will you look at that is not a bad summary of many good sermons. And it's one of the things that delivers us merely from cliche. We avoid cliche by that developing sense of how we're heard. We avoid it by asking ourselves in preparation what do I see? What truly can I invite people to look at? And there's a wonderful phrase in Shakespeare's The Tempest, which is often used to sum up that sense of wonder, where Prospero says to Miranda, what seest thou else? What seest thou else? Right, you're looking, look harder, what seest thou else? So, if one of the primary sins and failures of speech gone wrong is waving tribal flags and marking boundaries, graceful speaking and graceful preaching has to have about it that sense of avoiding cliché, genuinely inviting people to look 
at something which isn't me and isn't them, but is part of the landscape we share and are growing into. The second thing I noted yesterday had to do with the ways in which we approach our past and tell our stories. How we tell our stories and revisit our history in ways that do us favors, that present us as innocent, that allow us to look back without questioning. And so the second thing that I believe honest, good proclamation should do is to tell something of the church's story with honesty. Now by that I mean that preaching needs to acknowledge the reality of historic failure, macro and micro, the community's failures and misunderstandings, and the individual's. Proclamation tells a story of human fragility and of loss and of betrayal without despair. Yes, we have been there. We have been in places very far from Jesus Christ. And yes, Jesus Christ has been there with us. And that's really seriously different, I believe, from saying Jesus Christ has always been with us, so we've always been right. If you want to sum it up, it's more that Jesus Christ has always been with us, so we've always been forgiven. Or even Jesus Christ has always been with us because we've needed him to be with us because we've always been wrong. Something like that. So to look back at how we've learned in the history of the church and how we've learned in our own history of discipleship becomes part of the proclamation of the word that is near, the word in our hearts, on our lips, which continuously springs up in renewal and absolution if we are prepared to face it honestly. Now, I don't mean that every good sermon has to be a chronicle of the Spanish Inquisition or indeed of the appalling record of pretty well all the churches, mine included, in child protection in the last couple of decades. I don't believe either that the preacher needs to be constantly edifying or simply entertaining a congregation with the accounts of his or her own failures. I do mean that the willingness to say the church's capacity to get it wrong and to be held in God's renewing love is intrinsically part of what we are proclaiming. And once we stop doing that, we are into the realm of violence again. The violence of supposing that our identity, our presence is automatically right, absolved, normal, natural, etc. It so happened that earlier this year, the independent inquiry into child sex abuse was being conducted in London and the Church of England was being reviewed by this independent tribunal. As a former archbishop, I had to give evidence to the tribunal back in March and I must say that I found it concentrated my mind wonderfully for preaching in Holy Week a couple of weeks after that. Faced with the kinds of evidence of carelessness, insensitivity, bureaucratic incompetence, as well as exploitative evil, which we had not noticed or connived at or somehow allowed to slip down the list of priorities, I found that I came to Holy Week this last year with a very deep need to say something in preaching about the church's dramatic failure and betrayal and that that has had to be part of how to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ this Holy Week to this church at this time in this place. And I found it very difficult and I think so did the congregations I was speaking to. <laughs> 
and I'm not sure I found anything like the right words. But that is one of the things I believe we have to try. Somehow to reflect on what the church has learned by its failures, or failed to learn by its failures, and how something about the merciless compassion of Jesus Christ comes through our attention to those failures in the life of the church as in the life of every individual. And not allowing that to come into the language of our proclamation seems to me at the end of the day not good enough if we believe what we say about Christ the Word. So, the response to or the counter to that temptation to tell the story in a kind of Pollyanna-ish way, it's all for the best and it's all turning out perfectly well, the counter to that is allowing our preaching to be shaped by, challenged by, the reality of a very complex and not always pretty history. And if we're able to do that, then as I often find myself saying, the church really is modeling something for the world we're in. We are capable, are we? Let's hope so. We are capable as Christians of looking at our past and saying, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. So that we can admit where we failed, what we've learned, how we've changed. And that is a challenge, I believe, to any kind of social ideology which assumes that once you admit failure, you've admitted defeat. And once you've admitted defeat, you might as well go home and stop. Admitting defeat is, you might say, the Christian's victory. And that's something we have to say in a world desperately anxious about ever admitting weakness or ever showing frailty. Now that takes me on fairly obviously to another closely related issue. The words of our preaching and our proclamation are never going to be just descriptive, saying what's out there. They're going to be, if the spirit is truly at work, they're going to be words that work, that is, that do some work in people's hearts and minds. And part of the work they need to do is, to use the fashionable phrase, to give permission to people to recognize the dark and ambivalent places in their own histories. Good preaching gives permission. If it makes space, to use the metaphor I began with, it also gives permission. I hope that you have had, as I have had occasionally, the much graced experience of meeting somebody at the door who not only says, you might have been speaking directly to me, that wonderful remark yesterday about how we're thanked for things we never said after sermons, but also who says, do you know, you told me it was all right to feel as I feel, or to think what I think. You allowed me to bring that into focus, into light, and so allowed something buried or occluded or sidelined in me to come for a moment into a healing focus of God's light. Perhaps one of the things we need to say about preaching is that it allows things to come to light. Once again, think of the landscape, the light on the landscape. Yes, you can bring that in here and the same light shines on it. Good preaching excavates. Oh, perhaps we should say resurrects brings to life, brings to light. And if we can find ways of speaking which allow people, perhaps very tentatively, very carefully, 
to begin to look at what they've not wanted to look at and not to panic and not to run. It will have done its job. And the other side of that, which of course hardly needs underlining, is if we are also seeking to listen, to be in the place where our hearers are, we shall watch and listen in our own words for any signals we give that will shut things down or intensify a sense of pain, of unmanageable trauma, we will have to be very sensitive on that front also. And if that sounds difficult, I'm afraid it is. It's just one of those things we have to learn, as we have to learn it in fruitful human relationship. How to balance honesty in bringing things into light with not rushing people into premature solutions or situations they find they can't cope with. But at best, a good sermon gives permission, brings something into the light. Darkness and ambivalence, the things which, as we were saying yesterday, <clears throat> some people want to push out there onto the other, we need to acknowledge in ourselves. And again, when somebody says after a sermon, I didn't know Christians were allowed to feel that or think that, maybe you've done your job. It's a matter of letting Christ's light shine on all that is within. And it's another way of witnessing to the word that is very near. So we're beginning, perhaps, to get a picture of what an honest and creative preaching involves and how that honest and creative preaching builds a peaceable kingdom, builds an environment where people are free to look at themselves and one another afresh and to look together at what is more than any of them, where language is being very slowly, perhaps almost painfully slowly, being made new as the common world is rediscovered, re-evoked, reconstructed in our words. Which leads me to the last corrective I wanted to mention in relation to our language, which again goes back to things I was reflecting with you about yesterday. Preaching invites it invites even before it instructs or convicts. I quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer yesterday, and I tend to quote him on any and every opportunity. But Bonhoeffer, in his early days as a pastor, said that his greatest discovery about preaching was that it was like holding out a large red apple to a hungry child and saying, you'd like that. We hold out something. We invite to a meal. It's part of the sacramentality of preaching. And woe betide us if we forget that. Our preaching is not just giving a lecture, as we've been reminded many times. Not just the provision of instruction we could perfectly well ha have somewhere else. It occurs within an event of gathering where we are together so that we may be fed, so that we may grow. In my own tradition, the role of preaching within the Eucharist is of paramount importance because there, in one and the same moment, the breaking of the word and the breaking of the bread fit together, belong together. But in any and every Christian tradition, that element of gathering to be fed is a key dimension of what's going on. So invitation, and that means, yet again, a sensitive awareness 
of what it is in my words or my actions that prevents an invitation being heard or responded to. We heard from Terry this morning how an invitation can be, as it were, turned on its head or negated by the terms in which it is subtly crafted. Yes, of course you're welcome, exactly as you are. Just remember to take your shoes off at the door, hang your coat up, change your language, change your hairstyle, and that's fine, because we welcome everybody here. <laughs> and one of my more uh, painful experiences as a diocesan bishop was when I had to interview parish representatives when we were appointing new parish clergy. And I would ask something like, um, how would you like your church to grow? And people would scratch their heads and say, well, I don't know about that, Bishop. I think we've got about enough people in church now. <laughs> um, I, I quote, really, honestly. <laughs> There's the complaint about one of our clergy. One of the wardens came to me and said, we're not very happy about this new rector, Bishop. He's bringing all sorts of new people into the church. Um, <laughs> and congregations which would say, we're a very friendly church. My hackles always rise when I hear that after long experience of what that means, which means we really like each other. And there are worse things than that, believe me, in churches, and we've seen that too. But when we really like each other becomes we really don't like anybody else. Well, you see what I mean. The language of invitation needs to be tested pretty relentlessly. We need to be aware of what it is that actually stops people coming. You may say that, people say, but look at what you're actually doing. You may say you are welcoming, inclusive, whatever, but in fact, just let me tell you how I experience it. So, Preaching as invitation requires the same gifts of projection into the mind and the heart of the hearer, the same gift of taking the risk of listening to what I'm saying from another point of view that all the other points I've touched on require. And so in the light of all that, perhaps we are beginning to get some sense of what the, the habits are for preaching that will pull us back from the temptations I was trying to identify yesterday. The cliché watch, the willingness to tell the story honestly, the giving permission to recognize darkness or ambivalence within, and the return again and again to the priority of invitation, the large red apple placed on the table, sit and eat, George Herbert. So let me just take this back for a bit to some of our basic theological convictions and loyalties. I've spoken about building a house, creating a landscape, making a space where people can explore themselves and their wider world, and about how the word of God in Christ is always in the middle of that process, is the landscape itself, you might say. And as a preacher, I'm speaking in Christ. I'm speaking in a gathering of those who believe they are in Christ, those who have found their home in this place which is Christ, which is the Word, God's self-outpouring. But that means that in preaching I am speaking for Jesus. Dangerous doctrine this. You don't need me, I'm sure, to remind you that what it doesn't mean is that what I say is what Jesus is saying. 
There are plenty of congregations which seem to work on that principle, but they're not very good examples. But I am speaking for Jesus in the sense that when I stand up to speak and reflect in the midst of Christ's people, as I said earlier, I speak as part of the body of Christ in and to and with the body of Christ. Not delivering my thoughts to alien minds, not decanting what's in here to what's in there with a fair amount of spillage somewhere on the carpet in between, but exchanging within the body of Christ. And I guess that many of you will have the strong sensation as you preach of what a congregation is contributing to what you're saying. You find yourself sometimes thinking, I didn't know I knew that, I didn't know I could say that, because you're there with those people at that moment. Have you found that? Just, you know, just as a matter of interest. I, to me, it's, it's a very powerful element in preaching. I see a few nods around the place. And I used sometimes when I was um, preaching at the induction of new clergy in their pastorates to tell them the story of one of Martin Luther King's great sermons. I can't remember which one it was, but when he'd arrived at the city where he was preaching, exhausted and depressed, he was under great pressure from the FBI at that moment, threats of blackmail were flying around, he'd had a difficult journey, he arrived, he went to his hotel room and frankly did not feel like going out again to preach a sermon. So he sat there in the hotel room, his colleagues sat around him and said, come on, just, you know, just show your face, just go to the church and let them see you and you can come back again straight away. And eventually, after about an hour, Dr. King went to this downtown Baptist church where he was expected and where the congregation had been waiting for him for about two hours. Being a Baptist congregation, they weren't sitting there gloomily and self-righteously twiddling their thumbs. They were singing very hard. And by the time Dr. King arrived, the atmosphere was quite electric. King walked in, strode straight up to the pulpit, and launched in immediately to one of the great sermons of his career. He had been enabled and empowered by the people of God. And he delivered what he didn't know he had to say because of that. That's the deep sacramental reality of preaching. And that's part of what it means to be speaking for Jesus. Not delivering a message from Jesus back there through me to you, but finding within the community event that the word is near you and will come alive and that you discover something as you speak. But think too of Jesus' own speech, Jesus' own preaching, if you like. Jesus is somebody who quite clearly is a stranger to cliché. This is a new teaching with authority, say his hearers. This is not what we're used to. Jesus tells the story of Israel afresh. He tells the story as a story of failure and of faithfulness and gradually draws the threads of the story together into his own story. He tells stories not about religious events or religious contexts, but about the bare familiar reality of the life of tenants and laborers in Galilee. He creates a landscape I think it's fair to say that while the synoptic gospels often give quite varied pictures of what Jesus said, how he taught, versions of the parables, you can see the family resemblance. You know this is a distinctive landscape. It takes a bit longer to work that out with the fourth gospel, but I would argue that at the end of the day, 
the images, the perspectives are still there. That images and ideas which crop up in the synoptic gospels are present if transformed and relocated in the fourth gospel. It's not as if this is something completely different. He's shaping a landscape, shaping a perspective, and inviting people in. Because if there's one thing he really does, it's invitation, isn't it? Again and again and again, in parable and address and action, Jesus invites. He invites people to name their need. What do you want me to do for you? He invites people to sit with him. Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. He invites people to look at their passion and longing to achieve, to be different, and invites them to drop it. If you want to be perfect, sell what you have and come with me. He invites people to believe that even after they have failed and betrayed, they will be welcome. Where are those who accuse you? Go, sin no more. And of course, he invites still on the far side of his death and resurrection. Have you anything to eat? He says as he comes through the locked doors in Luke's Gospel. Come and have breakfast, he says in the last chapter of St. John's Gospel. The invitation, it seems, is the one thing that has the energy and depth to carry right through death and hell and to be as real as ever. I've toyed with the idea that perhaps the first Christian sermon is what Jesus says on the road to Emmaus. The first Christian sermon, the first utterance after the resurrection. I know Jesus preached sermons before, there's something called the Sermon on the Mount, but perhaps the first Christian sermon, the first proclamation of the resurrection is Jesus talking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, telling the story of why it was necessary for the pattern of failure and renewal to be brought to its climax in his own life and death. Making them name their own grief and confusion, gently rebuking it and weaving it in to the discourse. Making it new, so much so that the disciples on the road to Emmaus end up feeling that they've never really read the scriptures before and they're hungry and thirsty for more as they sit with him and he breaks bread and they recognize whose invitation has been at work. Preaching for peace is a preaching which grows out of all of this learning of how we speak in the body of Christ, I believe. Because in all these ways, we are shown to ourselves as human beings, not as naturally divided, naturally hostile, but naturally inhabitants of one place, naturally rooted together in one great reality, which is God's outpouring, self-giving, the Word made flesh in Jesus. This is where peace begins, where peace has its roots, in the recognition that we belong together in this. Paul's great sermon in Athens in Acts 17, he is made of one blood all nations of the earth, is just one of many ways in which that vision of recognition and solidarity comes through insistently in the pages of Christian scripture. Not tearing up or overturning the great legacy of Hebrew scripture, but gently and steadily unpeeling and opening out the implications of that history to say, well, if that's the case with Israel, 
what is the case for all God's children spread abroad? And because we have responded to that invitation, because we have believed the word that has invited us into this landscape, we stand in Jesus' territory, on Jesus' soil, speaking Jesus' words. We speak them imperfectly, discontinuously, confusedly, 99 times out of 100. And yet we go on seeking to have our language refined and deepened and made more authentic in our fellowship as we share. And that's why preaching, as I've implied more than once, that's why preaching is the voice of the church, not the voice of an individual. There are, of course, in the history of the church, great virtuosi of the pulpit. We were asked the other evening about preachers who had a great influence on us or whose model we sought to follow, and that's fine. But we ought to be a bit cautious about any model which suggests that the preacher is a concert pianist. The preacher is neither a concert pianist nor quite the conductor of a choir, but oddly somewhere in between. Someone who is spelling out, rehearsing, sketching the world into which she or he prays and hopes God's people will step further. Sowing generative words that deepen communion and allow the seeds of communion to flourish in our community and in the wider world. In preaching, the church declares itself, says what it is, which is why, as I say, there is something genuinely sacramental about it. Sacraments in the church are there so that the church is reminded what it's there for. The sacraments tell us that we are a community called by Christ, not a community inventing ideas about a distant, inspiring figure called Jesus but a community here and now called by Christ into a visible social reality, active, reflective, moving on all the time. The sacraments tell us that we need to be reminded who we are. We need to be reminded that we are brought into Christ in baptism, into this territory, that we need all the time to be fed and nourished by the ongoing powerful reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus. The sacraments tell us who we are, declare what the church is, and preaching is sacramental to the extent that precisely it tells us who and where we are. It tells us that we are a community which exists to witness to reconciliation. It tells us that we are here because God has chosen to build us together in a human community without limit and condition. And that's why when we declare ourselves as church, we intrinsically, automatically preach peace. And to do that, We need, as I've outlined, a powerfully self-critical habit, looking at the ways in which our language can go wrong and go sour and go exclusive and go dead on us. But maybe the last and most important thing to say in the light of all this is that preaching is celebration. Even when it has about it lament, challenge, the articulation of doubt or ambivalence, the recognition of failure, it must finally come back to celebration. And one of the worst things we can do if we're advocating for and working for peace 
is to forget celebration. We've all met activists of one sort or another who for all their admirable sacrificial work give off an air of desperate, intense concentration which makes you wonder what there is to celebrate about peace or justice at the end of the day. Grateful as I am for many great activists that I've met and worked with, I want all the time to come back to the question, well, why is this a matter of joy? Why is this a matter of thanksgiving? And to say, for the Church of God, it is vital that our witness for peace, our witness for justice, comes from and returns to celebration and thanksgiving. If all that I've said is right, then that celebration and thanksgiving won't be a kind of easy, facile cheerfulness. It won't just be complacency that everything is all right. It will be that kind of awed joy, that joy which finds it very hard to embody itself in words which arises from looking into the mystery. It's why preaching does indeed come from and return to silence like all Christian utterance, like all praise and thanksgiving. But if we ask, ultimately, why preach? If we ask what the function is of this on the sur surface of it, slightly odd activity that goes on in churches, the only real rationale is the twofold point that I've been trying to labor this morning. It reminds us who we are as a people by recreating this landscape we share, and it deepens our celebration and our thanksgiving. And in so doing, helps to make the entire community, not just the words of a preacher or a teacher, it makes the reality of the entire community good news. The good news of the Prince of Peace, who came to preach peace to those far off and those near at hand, whose life and death break down the partition walls of division between us and set us free for praise and thanksgiving and life eternal in his presence. Thank you. Dr. Williams, thank you. You do have a way of, and I've always found it reading your work, but now in your presence of, of really helping to us to see the stars again for the first time. And, and you have a way of making things that we have looked at and perhaps stopped seeing beautiful and rich again. Thank you. And we invited you, and yet through all of this time, you have been inviting us to something deeper and richer, and we thank you. And you've spoken to us about Christ in the midst, and you have been so present for us through these three days as a gracious listener and a warm and, and kind friend. God bless you, and thank you. And you're always welcome back. <laughs>